Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webinar. I would like to remind you that this conference is being recorded. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those connected by telephone requiring operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. Web participants requiring support should use the chat feature on your screen. I would now like to turn the meeting over to your moderator, Ms. Erin Leith, Director at CFHI. Please go ahead. Thanks very much. Hello and welcome to today's call, uh, on-call webinar entitled Improving Outcomes in Dual Diagnosis Specialized Care. I'm Erin Leith, Director of Education and Training at CFHI and I'm pleased to be your host today. We are pleased to have more than 130 few registrations for this session and I see that people are still actively signing on, so that's fantastic. As I introduce our guest speakers today, I'd like to ask you to take a moment to introduce yourselves in the chat box at the bottom right hand of your screen. As well, let us know how many people are attending it from your location using the, the poll on your screen. Please enter the number, including yourself. Joining us today are Robin Powell and Dr. Susan Farrell. Robin is the Director of Patient Care Services at the Community Mental Health Program at the Royal Ottawa, Ottawa Health Centre Group. Robin has initially worked as a frontline social worker with the homeless population in both Toronto and Ottawa. For the past 15 years, she has managed a variety of community-based teams, and Robin currently coordinates the ACT Central Intake in Ottawa, chairs the Eastern Ontario ACT Network, and sits on the technical, technical uh, advisory committee of the Ontario ACT Association. Robin is also the health partner co-chair for the Champlain East Regional Dual Diagnosis Action Committee. Dr. Susan Farrell is a clinical psychologist and clinical director of community mental health program at the Royal Ottawa Health Center group, or Health Care Group. Her clinical work has focused in, on persons with dual diagnosis that includes intellectual disability and mental illness and with others with severe and persistent mental illness living in community. A graduate of the Champlain Lynn Telfer Seniors Management Program and the Telfer School of Management, Dr. Farrell is an associate professor at the Faculty of Medicine and a clinical professor in the School of Psychology at the University of Ottawa and the director for training of the predoctoral postdoctoral predoctoral residency program in clinical psychology. We also have in our uh, studio today a producers, Tina Powell and Kelly Ripley, who are operating behind the scenes. Welcome to all of you. We are also pleased to provide simultaneous interpretation for all on-call webinars. This may result in a few quick pauses in the dialogue today, and we invite you to participate in our chat box today in either official language. I'd like to now hand it over to our speakers. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this invitation and opportunity. Uh, this is the voice of Susan Farrell and my colleague Robin and I will be sharing speaking today. We're excited to speak to you about this innovation that we've developed in our community from the wisdom and support of so many in our community, our clients, family members, community partners and providers, but also from the rich uh, service community across this country and the academic community even beyond Canadian borders. What we'd like to speak about today is a challenge that's been really important for us to address when it comes to act effectively serving the lives of people with a dual diagnosis, the innovation of our services, and then some of the work that we're doing and continuing to advocate for. You have the slides that we're going to speak to, so in order to make sure we preserve enough time for our discussion, we'll just be hitting the highlights of each of our slides. Here's how we're going to frame our remarks and then make all the slides as they are available to you. First and most importantly, to speak a little bit about the challenge. Simply put, in dual diagnosis, we have a small segment of our national population with complex specialized needs that use a high percentage of healthcare resources, but often not to improved outcomes. The challenge lies in how to deliver effective and efficient care at better care and lower costs to meet the complex needs of people who we'd like to see effectively living and participating in their community. So specifically, here's the group of people that I'm speaking of. This is the bell curve or the distribution of intelligence scores and intellectual disability is from the arrow leftwards, so just over 2% of the population. A small number overall, 
But in definitional terms, this is a group of people who often have some of the most complex needs when it comes to health care and related community care that they need. Intellectual disability and adaptive functioning or their ability to live and thrive in their communities as well as having a mental illness is what defines a person as having a dual diagnosis. So why is this population so unique or such a challenge to deliver effective and efficient health care services? Well, one of the findings that is universal in our area, I suspect in yours and all through our country and beyond, is that the psychiatric service needs of individuals with a dual diagnosis are significant when compared to the needs of those in the general population without intellectual delay. We see our dual diagnosis clients using emergency departments more frequently, having higher rates of hospitalization, and being much more likely to be deemed status alternate level of care or ALC than others. They're considered to have complex specialized needs, to have sometimes differential response to pharmacological interventions, the different behavioral needs, and often many more challenges when integrating effectively into the community, the place where we'd all like to imagine them leading meaningful lives. I want to give you a bit of a context of where and how our innovation was developed first by orienting you to where we physically are located. So we are located in Ottawa. If you look at the yellow section on this map, this is the local health integration network area of Champlain. And what you see by how it is is that we are with a group of people and a population that is just close to 10,000 individuals. We cover urban and rural areas. We cover significant linguistic divide. Uh, we have French and English speaking communities as many other communities. We have a lot of people who are new to Canada within our services. Gives you a sense also if you were to go from tip to stern and tip again, you'd be at about just shy of five hours of driving. So in our region in 2012, this is how it was estimated that uh, the percentage or the number of people with a dual diagnosis, with a severe mental illness or another type of mental illness. What we see from our research colleagues is that our experience of incidence rates match pretty closely to some of the provincial and other uh, estimates in the province. So again, sometimes it can be seen that we're not talking about as large a group of people, but a very important group of people whose needs are often not effect sufficiently effectively met in general mental health services. This was perhaps best highlighted this summer in the province in the Ombudsman of Ontario's report. The Ombudsman talked about the crisis situations for people with developmental disability and specifically highlighted those with a dual diagnosis, speaking about the fact that there was a need to continue, develop, and evaluate the continuum of care for people, meaning that many different types of healthcare options needed to be available to individuals to keep them from languishing in other types of services. So some context to that. That gives you a snapshot of where we are and what's happening or the thinking in the province about healthcare to give you some context to how FACT-DD, or the Flexible Assertive Community Treatment Team for Persons with a Dual Diagnosis, first came to be. Using the wisdom and the advocacy of many of our partners across the province, we participated a few years ago in a provincial review of dual diagnosis programs. The provincial review started off as a review of inpatient services in six Ontario hospitals, but it was quickly realized that one could not have a conversation about inpatient services without thinking about the entire continuum of care, meaning what is available for outpatients, community care, and different types of services. We at the Royal participated in that, but what was very striking was when we agreed upon from the research and the, and the wisdom of others, a specialized continuum of services, most of that continuum, especially treatment services, was missing across our entire LIN. So in the broad area in which we live, we did not have any of those services available for folks with a dual diagnosis which left many people with ALC status, which was a high cost to the system and not necessarily anything to promote their well-being. At the time of the provincial review, we had no specialized inpatient services for dual diagnosis and we were the only LIN without them at that point. The provincial review recommended one bed for 100,000 individuals or about 16 beds. 
the Provincial Review recommended multidiscipline treatment services. In one part of our LIN in the Brockville and area that you can see here, we did have one service team, but in Ottawa and some of the rest of the areas of the LIN, we had no treatment services, no outpatient treatment services, and a consultation team. So our conclusion was that most of the continuum was missing in the Champlain LIN, forcing people with a dual diagnosis to receive their services in the wrong parts of the care system. This is the continuum of care that was published through the Provincial Review. And what you can see in the faintly shaded boxes is the only services that were available at the time of this review for our entire region. So for more than 5,000 people where this could have been relevant at certain times, we had very few things that were available to them. So now what I'd like to do is invite my colleague Robin to speak to you a little bit that given this context, given what we understood to be best care for the complex needs of the dual diagnosis population, what did we do to respond to the challenge of building a community-based service for them? Thank you, Susan. <clears throat> So I'm here to speak about the innovation, which is FACDD. And we're going to start off by <clears throat> looking at how the Royal responded to the KPMG Provincial Review. The Royal responded in three ways. The first way was to look at our consultation team and redesign the skill mix to match the presenting problems of the DD patients. We knew that 100% of the referrals had a behavioral component yet we were lacking behavioral supports on the team, so we added some behavioral supports. The second way we responded was to develop a proposal for a flexible assertive community treatment team for the DD population. This would give us the ability to provide both high intensity and low intensity service for those clients. And finally, we developed an inpatient proposal for inpatient beds. The model for Flexible Assertive Community Treatment Team, or FACT, was developed in the Netherlands. It's an evolution of the ACT model, which some of you may be familiar with. Our adaptation of this model for the DD population is the first in Canada. In fact, it's the first anywhere, to our knowledge. We wanted to be able to respond to the needs of the DD population within the entire LIN. The Champlain LIN supported the need for regional programs, but at the time, they were only able to fund the Ottawa portion. In the end, the Ministry of Community and Social Services stepped up and was able to fund satellite offices in both Cornwall and Pembroke, allowing us to provide service across the, <coughs> the entire link to the DD population. Overview of fact. A couple of basic facts about fact. Oh, sorry, you flipped that. Okay, thank you. Um, overview about fact. A couple of basic facts about fact. Fact teams carry higher client caseloads than ACT teams. FACT teams usually carry 180 to 220 clients. So how do they do this? The way they do this is um, through the different level of intensity, and that is one of the major differences between FACT and ACT. On a FACT team, 20% of the clients are followed at an intensive level of service. So that would mean they'd have about two to three contacts a week, plus the involvement of several team members at the same time. The other 80% of the clients are followed at a lower level of intensity, more like a case management style, with contacts every two to five weeks, depending on the need. Here are some of the building blocks of FACT. As you can see, FACT is a recovery-oriented model of service. We begin by providing treatment, intensive involvement, and support around rehab and recovery, and move on to building super social inclusion, linking clients to services depending on their need, and always keeping the client needs front and center. Here are some of the innovations of FACT. This summarizes the characteristics and care requirements of a FACT team. So FACT provides a mix of both ACT and case management. It has the ability to change service intensity as needed. This is particularly helpful for the dual diagnosis population who may experience changes, tra ch sorry, challenges transitioning over to new caregivers and uh, benefits from consistency in the caregivers. FACT uses a biopsychosocial model. So FACT addresses illness and symptoms but goes beyond that, 
helping with housing, legal concerns, relationships, leisure, and other things that probably matter the most to clients. There's also a crisis intervention component to help service clients 24-7. So what did we do to adapt FACT for the DD population? We looked at the skill mix and treatment protocols, and these were informed by the provincial review that Susan talked about. Uh, there's increased behavioral supports. BSTs are under the, the supervision of the clinical psychologist. We've added developmental service workers under, who understand the DS sector, and we've enhanced the vocational and occupational support. It was important to develop a LIN-wide um, uh, service to address DD population needs across the region, and we also included capacity building to provide support to caregivers. Uh, the new service is part of our community mental health program, which is actually located in a mall in Ottawa, which um, works well. It's an it's a easy place for people to come and receive services. And we have two satellite offices, one in Pembroke and one in Cornwall, that are actually both located at a developmental service sector agency. Those of you familiar with ACT will notice the difference in the skill mix with a FACT DD team. Behavioral supports are so important for this population. As you see, we have a BST and clinical psychologist, as well uh, DSWs, developmental service workers, who are specially trained to work with the population and within the developmental service sector. So who is served by FACTD? So we're looking at an age group, 18 plus, um, people who have an intellectual disability, and have eligibility for Developmental Services Ontario. We use the same eligibility criteria. And you'll see by the last several factors listed there, we're looking for, for clients who have evidence of high service resource use. So tend to be people who may be using a lot of emergency services, may even be in the criminal justice system, they have difficulty maintaining housing, etc. So again, there needs to be an element of high service use. So how do we mobilize people or our community to help support this, this uh, proposal for FACTD? We were very active and still are very active in the Champlain East Region Dual Diagnosis Action Committee, or SIRDAC. And that committee is composed of developmental sector and health agencies, uh, family member representation, as well as um, representation from our local LIN and MCSS offices. So CERDAC was a perfect forum, we think, to start to discuss some of the, well, the, the committee was well aware of the concerns and uh, lack of treatment for the group, and it was a great forum to discuss the provincial review and the, the proposal uh, for LIN funding. So we received a lot of support around this table. And then the last slide, that <coughs> before I hand it back to Susan, is just, um, saying that uh, we, were very we were very fortunate to have the uh, innovative partnership of the two ministries. Um, you know, the LIN had, was, had really wanted to fund the urban team, and at the time they didn't have enough uh, uh, funding available to them to be able to provide the satellites, although um, they were committed to that. And so, as mentioned, the Ministry of Community and Social Services stepped up to provide funding for the two regional offices. With that, I'm going to hand it back to Dr. Farrell. Thank you. So one of the things that's important in talking about the uh, adaptation or innovation of bringing the flexible assertive community treatment model to the dual diagnosis population is to think for a little bit about how will we demonstrate whether or not this adaptation has been both correct but also delivering better care in a more effective way to reach better health outcomes. So using uh, the published literature as well as the perspective of clients, family members, and others, we made sure that the program was designed before the first client was ever introduced with an evaluation and assessment framework in mind. Simply put, you can see here on this slide that we are looking at a number of different client and program outcomes. The ones you might expect in healthcare, such as symptom reduction, uh, improved quality of life, recovery, but also looking at other stakeholders like support to families and care providers. 
looking at systems variables like the reduction in external service use, reduction in the number of crises or crisis service use, reduction in unmet needs for people, and then importantly, improvement in the activities of their daily living skills. So we're looking not just to reduce psychiatric symptomatology in a group of people, but also meaningful community engagement and meaningful understanding for care providers as well as family members and others to really engage with this group of people. One of the things that continues to be important to us is the education that we provide as well. So we do a lot of work in treatment and recovery planning with clients, but also with their care providers in doing that sort of work and taking a look at what are the goals for a person at a given time and how do we work as a multidisciplinary team to support them to define the purpose of our visits with individuals, but also their place in the broader community and how we continue to grow that. One of the challenges that has often been faced for individuals with a dual diagnosis is how they access certain specialty assessments. Particularly in our province, perhaps in others as well, psychology assessments because it becomes the basis of access to other sorts of funding. Psychiatry assessments because it has such a key role in treatment. So we have made it a priority to provide these assessments within what we do for services. If we don't know about someone's eligibility, we will provide an abbreviated assessment, particularly from psychology, both to determine eligibility, but if they're not a client for the FACT team, this still gives information to other care providers. It might sound like it's a simple thing to say, but it's a critical thing to provide in the healthcare system that if we were going to shut a door for someone, we open a window for other services. So what have we done by creating the FACT-ED service? If we go back to the Provincial Review Continuum of Care, what we've done here is we've been able to provide much more of the continuum by doing things this way. If you can see in blue shading, what we've done is across a number of pillars of the optimized continuum of care, we directly contribute to service provision, supporting activities, education, and other things but we also indirectly support things through our capacity building role. So much more of the continuum of care across the Champlain Lynn in both English and French is now available to people with a dual diagnosis and the people who support and care for them. From our perspective, there are some key benefits to this model. We know at the level of the individual there's improved care customized to them. It's very different to provide care for someone with a severe intellectual disability and a psychotic disorder than it is for someone with a mild intellectual disability and episodic depression. So we really work hard to make sure that our care is customized to their needs and their meaningful life in the community. It leads to better outcomes for the individual and functional improvements in their life in the community setting, benefiting all other stakeholders with whom they interact in the community. And there's some really important system level or upstream impact variables. It's to improve the continuum of care for this challenging but very rewarding population. To reduce their time in alternate level of care status, reduce their use of the emergency department or emergency room so that care is delivered in the right place in a preventative manner. It's, inter it's prevention by the application of intervention to reduce incidents between caregivers and patients, to support caregivers, to promote their safety, their sense of capacity, and also to reduce things like restraint use, pharmacological or mechanical, and improve the quality of life that the system experiences as well. We've met many care providers who noted, noted burnout or high levels of fatigue from this care, and our goal is to, for people to find serving this population to be highly rewarding. Sometimes we get asked a little bit about what's it like to be on the fact team, what's a day in the life? And so this is just a quick slide that talks about how do we come together as a team. We have morning client reports meetings, we touch base all through the day, we do a lot of our visits in the community, in fact more than 80% of our care is delivered outside of our walls in the client environments of choice. And all clients have a prime or a main staff member, that's the contact, but we share contact across the different disciplines of the team. So it's meant to be a team model of care, a team of professionals that consider the person with a dual diagnosis and his or her care providers also as part of the team. In doing that and looking at the system and care providers also as key stakeholders, we look at our capacity building and what we do predominantly through providing education. 
So we have presented an awful lot to local agencies in our early developmental phases, but continue to do so. Presenting to developmental agencies, to hospitals and hospital emergency rooms, both urban and rural. Focusing on working together to address client complexity and systems issues and capacity building in primary and secondary care providers. One of the best benefits that we experience when we do capacity building is to meet a staff in another setting who says, you taught me some strategies for John Doe, and now I've been able to use them with Jane Doe as well. So we're working to build knowledge of the specialized needs of people with a dual diagnosis and how to serve them across our local area, and also provincially by being involved in things like guidelines for managing challenging behavior. We have the privilege of being with you today in a national level and also doing some North American wide presenting about our model of service, its early development and some of its early outcomes. We've been a team for just over a year and it's already time for us to be thinking really actively about our future outcomes and our continued advocacy. Looking forward, one of the things that's most important to us is at the time that we handed these slides to translation, we were at 46 clients, we're now at 60, so we're growing quickly. We figure that's been a, just a short time interval since these slides were submitted. Um, we are always looking to move our clients from that higher level of service need to the lower level of service need. Being very sensitive that clients will come back and forth as that is needed, but taking a look to understand how do we help people being in a lower level of service need or more settled in their communities, to continue to provide education, quickly prioritizing people who are inpatients as well, and to continue to measure outcomes in order to see our clients move towards recovery. Those are important things for us, but we cannot forget the challenges that remain in continuing to serve the population. While we believe that this will be demonstrated to be an innovative treatment model to provide community-based specialized care, and our early outcomes all point in that direction, we still have to recognize that we will be challenged because the entire continuum of care is not yet available in our region. Specifically, Robin mentioned that our three-part response to the provincial review had been looking at our own consultation team. We effectively dealt with its weightless management strategies. We've developed FACTD, but we still don't have dedicated inpatient beds or resources, and we're continuing to look at that to see how that works within the continuum of care to ensure individuals are not ALC status in other mental health beds. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Perhaps the most important slide in the whole deck is the one that's just come up now because that's our email addresses. Robin and I are really committed to keeping in touch with anybody who shares interest in this, shares a perspective in things that we could be evaluating, shares our challenges because as we said, this came together with the joint wisdom of so many people whose perspective we really value and we'd love to continue to have a conversation about our work. Thank you. Thanks very much, Susan and Robin. We now have an opportunity to take questions that you may have from the audience, so please share with us your questions using the chat box at the bottom right of your screen. We have one question coming in from Susan Ross from Vancouver who would like to little, know a little bit more about the inpatient service, and she's asking, do you find it necessary to link with inpatient services and what is needed? Sure. I'll take that just because we're co-Susan. So hi, Susan. <laughs> I'm Susan Farrell. Um, yes, linking with inpatient services is critically important because we do not have any dedicated dual diagnosis inpatient services in our LIN. So we work with psychiatric and general medical inpatient services. We have done the intake for the FACT team for many clients while they are psychiatric inpatients. Sometimes they will be an inpatient for a little bit longer while their housing is being established and other things, but we get involved and we meet them at that point so we can be helpful in supporting that transition. We sometimes are involved with people before they're medically ready to come out of the hospital, usually because we're involved in doing things like setting behavioral plans for them to optimize their time in hospital and reduce the risk of things like restraint use or other things because their dual diagnosis may not be as well understood by a general medical floor, psychiatric floor, or something like that. Great. 
I have a whole host of other questions of things I'd like to explore with you guys. So while people are taking a few minutes to collect their thoughts and put in a question, um, I'm going to ask one, which is um, around, we had talked earlier, Susan, about the impact and, you know, the potential for engaging with the GPs, the general providers, as you sought to shift from the current practice, which really wasn't all that long ago, um, to shift where you are now, that level of engagement and buy-in you had to in work with and to develop with GPs, and how did you how did you sell them on this new model, and what has been the results since they've participated in it? That's a great question. So, family physicians or general practitioners are really important part of the continuum of care. For one thing, um, uh, the primary care guidelines we've been able to share those with a number of family physicians to share with them with some of their practice how it can be optimized in the care of people with a dual diagnosis. But importantly, before the FACT team was developed, we had only a consult team in the Ottawa area and the outlying areas except for Brockville of the Champlain Lynn, which meant that the GP was still holding the predominant amount of care and we had long waiting lists for that service. So we've changed our strategy, as Robin mentioned, we changed our skill mix, and we are really actively involved with family physicians to understand how to optimize their role in care, but understand what it is that we can be providing as well. Now on the FACT team, where clients have a longer relationship with us, we still believe it's critically important to have a relationship with family physicians so that they maintain that primary care health role mm -hmm. for individuals, and we provide an additional specialized role. We actively linked with many family physicians, calling them directly to tell them about our services, speaking at family physician forums. Mm -hmm. We speak a lot to medical residents as well, particularly the ones that are going to meet our population at 3 a.m. in the emergency room, um, and really make sure that the group of primary health care providers feel as supported as possible by us so that we're true partners in care. And ultimately, in just in terms of the link with wait times, yes. I re recall, I don't want to yeah. misquote, but I believe there was a massive reduction. They, they could see, That's patients right. were seen more quickly, Yes. but then referred back more quickly. So on our consultation mm -hmm. team, which is a model that we haven't described in as much detail today, but this is a short-term assessment and consultation model for dual diagnosis, before we did the skill mix Robin spoke about, we were plagued by an almost 14-month waiting list. And so we really need to, to think about What's our model of service and what is it that people are coming to us for? It was particularly important to appreciate that where people were often coming for an understanding of diagnostic clarification, behavioral strategies, and sometimes medication review. We changed the skill mix on our team. We ensured that people had at least a conversation from our intake clinician within two weeks. And we called all of the referral physicians, so there was more than 90, to explain this new model of care saying that until the FACT team was going to be fully developed, there'd be shorter consults, but they would be in a much more timely manner. That yielded appreciation from the community and being that transparent, and it also yielded a couple letters of support for the FACT proposal. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a question now for uh, Robin, which I, I heard you speak about the building capacity for caregivers. And that's a big part of what CFHI is about supporting patient and family engagement and how we support the loved ones of people with mental illness. Um, could you speak a little more about the capacity building for caregivers and what you do in that regard? <clears throat> sure. So I think, um, uh, you know, a FACT client is, uh, they could be living in a variety of different environments. So mm -hmm. they might be living in a developmental sector group home. Mm -hmm. uh, many could be living with family. They might be living independently. So there's a number of different environments that they could be living in. And, of course, uh, all kinds of different, um, you know, family, staff, um, uh, or even, even um, as Susan said, GPs and so on who are involved with their care. So the, the FACT team would see it as part of its job would be to work in a both informal way. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of informal education that would be done with care. In fact, most of it would be informal. Mm -hmm. So as we work with somebody, clearly we also need to work with their their, their caregivers so that they're, they're part of the plan and um, uh, that we're able to share information with them, et cetera, right? There have been, I and mean, we have done, and as we go forward, given it's still a fairly new service, we're not quite one year old, right? Um, but we, you know, the plan will be to do more. Uh, we've done some education, kind of at a at a uh, higher level, um, with with other providers. 
but you know, we've, we've talked about maybe doing some more sorts of formal uh, capacity building mm -hmm. um, for, for different agency staff mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as well as, as family members. Yeah. So that's great. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask another question, which is around the annualized funding, because that was something when I learned about this initiative that struck me, because that is very challenging to do. Uh, you know, CFHI is all about supporting the spread and, and uh, leading the development of improvement and spreading the ideas that demonstrate real promise and evidence. Um, but, you know, there are many of those out there, very viable, uh, you know, evidence-informed um, innovations in healthcare and that are proving that we can deliver services better with better quality of care for, you know, a, 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 an improved focus on funding as well even, better allocation of dollars. But getting a program to be actually picked up by the ministry and funded as an annualized program is not a small feat uh, when there's so many competing good ideas out there. So could you give some sense of how you were able to achieve that? What were, what were the key elements of data and, and dem what you had to demonstrate um, and key champions that needed to be sort of in, in, in alignment for you to receive that annualized funding? Mm -hmm. Um, oh, well, I, I can take part of that sure. and certainly jump in if, uh, but um, I think one of the realities is that within the LIN, um, our LIN representatives were at many meetings where they were hearing a lot about this population mm -hmm. and they were aware that um, um, the dual diagnosis population was uh, landing in a lot of the wrong places. So mm -hmm. whether it's emergency rooms, as Susan said, or, you know, ALC. We have people, unfortunately, landing in the criminal yeah. justice system, mm -hmm. uh, shelters, and uh, Lynn representatives were hearing a lot about that. So I think um, certainly there was a lot of support across really health, but also the DS sector for this kind of a service. It, I, I don't want to say it wasn't hard to sell, but there was a, it was a very clear need. I think the idea of needing treatment to prevent a revolving door in acute types of healthcare was an easy idea to sell, as Robin said, or prevention from homelessness, incarceration, and other sorts of things. One of the things that helped the argument was the business case costing of the expense of somebody to be ALC and not have good health or quality of life outcomes versus what we anticipated it would cost for each of the persons served by the fact team. So it makes a strong economic argument as well as then being able to speak to the health care outcome argument that Robin's quite right, people heard more about because our community advocacy efforts and our action group have family members on them and have people from a variety of different service agencies. So the stories were there and the economics and the model to believe in with an evaluation framework was what was provided. Right. Okay, my last question, this will be the last call for people on the line if you do have questions you want to put in today. Otherwise you do have, you'll receive the slides at the end so you will have uh, the ability to follow up with Susan and Robin directly. But uh, my last question, um, unless there are others from the audience, would be what do you see as the potential of this model and how can other people learn from it? Are, are, is there already expressions of interest from other regions that would like to learn more or have expressed interest in setting up their own FACT DD program or what do you see as the potential for this model? Good question. Yeah, there's a couple of different things. So one is we have had some people quite interested in, in its potential, and I think this is where our evaluation is going to be particularly important. Um, I think the flexibility that it offers is important particularly for this population. Robin made mention of it already, but for many folks, the challenges or transitions in the healthcare system are particularly challenging if you have a dual diagnosis or a diagnosis that could be all-encompassing like autism spectrum mm -hmm. disorder. And so people are looking at how to minimize healthcare transitions. Mm -hmm. The model should be very transportable across jurisdictions. We are already piloting it in an urban and a rural way. We're piloting it, piloting it and now have it one year implemented across a very wide geography. In fact, in the Netherlands is a neighborhood model. So we've already blown it across quite a significant sized neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're really happy to share our thinking with folks, particularly the lessons we learned or the missteps we learned in implementing it if other people are interested in thinking about that. 
There are some fact teams being developed in Canada for mental health needs because of the flexibility that the model offers. Mm -hmm. So we're happy to speak to that group of people, but also to people who want to look at it to address dual diagnosis care. Great. Okay, and I don't see any other questions coming into the chat box, so I'm going to assume they've addressed them all. Um, so thank you very much for the excellent and engaging discussion today. We hope that you have found the session informative and will join us again in the near future. I will take the opportunity to let participants know that we do have upcoming on-call webinars on December 15th. On-call will be delivering a webinar entitled The Evolution of Patient and Family Engagement uh, and Partnerships in the Models in Quebec. This webinar will highlight how CFHI is building on the success of its partnering with Patients and Families Quality Improvement Collaborative and uncovering new pathways to innovation in the area of patient engagement. In the new year, on January 11th and February 8th, join us for sessions two and three of Transforming Care for the Elderly, ensuring that seniors receive appropriate and person-centered care. Join us then to hear about the success of an innovative pharmacy practice model that aims to improve prescribing and care outcomes for the elderly. We also invite you to sign up for CFHI's new newsletter and keep an eye on your email for full listings of our upcoming webinars. Your feedback is value, invaluable to us for future webinar design, so we uh, can always improve. Uh, we ask that you take just a few moments now to provide us with your feedback on today's session and answering the polling questions on your screen. Once again, I would like to thank both Robin and Susan for their excellent presentation today and Kelly and Sheena for their fantastic production ability. And we'd like to thank you, of course, our audience for joining us today. This does enjoy, uh, conclude today's webinar. Have a great day.